Uh, one of the rules of TED is that you're not supposed to make it too personal, but I can't share with you all the things that we're doing, and it is a we, without telling you a bit about me, because you have to join the dots, as Steve Jobs says. You can only join the dots going backwards. So I'm going to tell you a few stories, and then I'm going to tell you what we're doing, and then I'm going to make some offers to you, uh, because we're all about contribution in the Ministry of Entrepreneurship, Mo Foundation. So 11 years old, uh, I, I lived on a council estate in Kent. Lots of people in the 70s, 80s did. Council estates were, you know, lots of them, and they're not like some of the council estates that I work with, some of the kids I work with now, which are horrific. Uh, ours was a good council estate. But at 11 years old, I went down to Longfield, uh, and I loved football. I was big into sport, can't you tell? Look how fit I look now. Um, and I loved sport, but I didn't have any money. My family had a lot of love, but we didn't have any money. And I remember, and I'm not going to name or shame him, but I could, because I still remember his name. Uh, I went out with some friends, and I went to a jumble sale. Who remembers jumble sales? Yeah, so I went to a jumble sale, and I was playing football, but I was playing football in trainers, and this kid bought me a pair, of a pair of football boots, my first ever pair of football boots, and it cost 30p, 40p. Still remember the number, you can tell. Um, and I thought, my God, what a wonderful, generous act. That's beautiful. Um, and then the very, the very next day on the Monday, so over the weekend, then on the Monday I went to school, and every single person in school knew that he'd bought them, and they took the mick out of me. And it taught me a big lesson. It taught me a lesson, which was, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. So at 11 years old, I learned that lesson. You're not going to do that to me ever again. And I went to work, but I didn't go to work in terms of education. I went to work, and I started to earn a living. I started to build little businesses and start to make money so that I could buy my own trains, and no one could stop me having the things I wanted to have. At 13, I had an epiphany, and I really remember this. I was playing football, and I was really tired. And I, and I had this vision, which was, my God, 300 odd million people in Europe, if I could sell them one product and make one P, what could we do with that? And I didn't think about driving around in a Ferrari. I thought, what is the contribution? What are the things that I could do to help people like me? At 16, I left school with no qualifications. So any of you have got kids and you're worried about it, I had a D, was my best grade in English. I got E, Fs and Gs. I got a G in engineering, and then I went into an engineering job. Work that out. So here's someone who's completely started off down the wrong route. At 24, I left that job, went to see a career advisor. She looked at my CV, and she said, I'm not really sure what you're going to do. I'm not really sure what we can do for you and with you. And I walked out of that pretty upset. As I stand here before you today, I've got a first-class honours degree. I've got a master's from Cranfield in innovation, and I run three successful organisations, all that, run, uh, that are all community-led. So I'm on the global board of the Association for Coaching. We've got 5,500 members across 45 countries. We've got 15,000 coaches in our network. And the really amazing thing is we've got 250 volunteers across those 45 countries who do stuff and they don't get paid. It works. I run a consultancy business. So I go into organisations. I don't bitch about financial services. I don't bitch about education. I go and try and do something to influence it, to try and improve it. And that's how I do it. That's how I earn a living. And then, a couple of years ago, we set up Mo Foundation. And I'm going to tell you more about Mo Foundation in a second. But here's a couple of top tips. In a minute, I'm going to tell you the real why and the legacy behind Mo Foundation. And it's a very personal story, but I'm going to share it with you. I think it's one of the things I see about people that feel happy in life is because they're in service of something that's bigger than themselves, often bigger than their own lifetime. So don't think about your lifetime. Think about the generations. I've got two young daughters. I already know my two young daughters will be trustees of Mo one day. Yeah? It's like, think beyond your own lifetime and think about the contribution each of you can individually and collectively make. Be really conscious about gifting. I love the starfish story. It's a parable that anyone who's done coach training will know about. Uh, it's absolutely, you know, absolutely wonderful. I don't believe in random acts of kindness. I don't even believe in deliberate acts of kindness. I believe in deliberate acts of loving kindness. We need more love in this world, not less. And we're scared of the world of love. I walk into organizations and we talk about loving leadership like it's something we should be scared of. But actually, the best leaders in the world are the people that you, you know, engage with emotionally because they make you feel good about yourself. They make you think that you can do things you never saw you had the potential to do it. And when I met Mark, it was really fantastic because he knew I was really involved in uh, coaching. And he said to me, that's really amazing, Darren. He said, so what you've got there is a Trojan horse. 
You give people the skills of a coach and it helps them go out there in the world and do things that they didn't think were possible. So we've got a positive way of thinking about Trojan horses now. And I was, um, I was uh, talking to somebody earlier and they gave me a great phrase. She said, oh, you're democratising coaching. So that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to take coaching and take money out of the way so that anyone can get access to it. A couple of other things. Take personal responsibility. I'm not going to get into it any more than that in a minute. I'm going to show you a quick model, because I keep hearing it. I've heard it here you know, while I've been here. I'm going to show you why you've got to take personal responsibility and not blame anyone else. And then entrepreneurs, in my experience, we seek forgiveness, not permission. Employees seek permission. So seek forgiveness, not permission. And then the other thing is, I think there's a new breed of entrepreneur emerging, and they're called purposeful entrepreneurs. I'm not talking about social entrepreneurs. It's beyond that, because a lot of my friends who are social entrepreneurs are struggling. Their businesses are struggling, so we've got to help them. So, here I am. That's my brothers and sisters and I, and that's me looking a lot skinnier, but I've still got long legs and no body and no neck. Um, so, you know, this is, this is where we grew up. Uh, my brothers and sisters and I, because of where we grew up, we, we got conditioned to look at, you know, poverty and understanding the challenges that other families were having. We were very lucky. We had a dad who had a good job, a reasonable job. We didn't have huge amounts of money, but we had enough. But more important than the money we had one thing that a lot of the kids I work with now haven't got, and that is love, yeah? We had love as a family. We had a sense of commitment to each other, and a lot of kids don't. So over the last few years, my brothers and sisters and I have done loads of different stuff. This was the third charity I ran, and the last, can't you tell? Uh, you know, so <laughs> we ran that for different charities. One, uh, one was the N uh, National Children, uh, Children's Homes. Uh, I think we raised about two or 3,000 pounds. But we were... We, we're always conditioned to try and do something that would help other people. But then our lives changed fundamentally. So I'm going to take you to 10th of July 2000. Uh, and I'm sitting at home and I get a phone call and it says, Darren, you've got to come home. I'm like, why have I got to come home? Darren, you just need to come home. I don't want to come home. You've got to come home. It's next door neighbour. So I come home and I find that my mother, who was 52 years of age, is dead. She's died of an epileptic fit. Now, my mother had married a second husband, and this man was not a particularly nice person. And I saw this woman go from the matriarch of our estate to being a frumpy, lonely, isolated woman. And we didn't have the skills and talents to help her. And so, my brothers and sisters and I were desperate at that point in our lives. We were absolutely so upset, as any of you that have been through something like that can imagine. It's awful. And I feel for anyone that ever goes through it. And we needed a big why. And so, at her funeral, we got up in front of 200-odd people... And we said, we don't know what, we don't know when, we don't even know how, we just know why. And the why for us is one day we're going to set up a foundation that's dedicated to our mother, a legacy to all the things she taught us, love, optimism, confidence, seeing beauty in the life. We're going to create an organisation that helps kids like we were. And so that's where the Mo Foundation has come from. So the reason I work more hours than anyone else I know is because I've made a commitment to my mother. It's a legacy for me. It goes beyond my lifetime. It's not about money. And I think that's really important. So when you're thinking about what you're trying to do here, I think you want to really work hard on thinking about what's the you know, long-term legacy? What's the big why? Because if you get clear on the big why, I think Simon Sinek said it in TED, brilliant piece. If you get really clear on the why, you can find you know, the ways to do stuff. So get really clear on the why, the deeper purpose, the deeper contribution. And we've got some sayings in Mo, and this is our little Mo character, uh, you know, uh, advertising Mo TV. A few years ago, we did a, a Mo kids book. So when we first launched Mo, we did a kids book, um, and it's the A to Z. I'm, I'm glad to say we've sold two copies on Amazon. So two copies. So if any of you want to find it and make it three, thank you, that would be great. The phrase here is, make a difference in a moment. And what that means is, every single one of us can do something good for someone else. What we're thinking about doing is a moment, you know, on the 10th of July, forever, we create a mad in a moment day, you know, and we all just try and do one thing to make someone's life better, because it makes a huge difference. And then the big model, the system that we've created is we gift, you gain. We all give and we grow together, yeah? And so what we've been able to do in the last two years, we've gifted £350,000 worth of development to 150 young people in the UK. So we literally, all of you here, your children, we would gift to you a £2,500 five-day coach program, which would get you an accredited level coach training program, and it would get you into the Association for Coaching. So you learn core skills, and we gift it to you because I want to absolutely take money off the table. I want to give people the skills that school doesn't always equip you for. 
that your parents aren't able to equip you for. When I'm thinking about what we do is I think we've tried to create an anthropology. Now, Mo is not about Mo. Mo is not about us. There is a huge network of people who we work with. We've got 12 charitable partners in the UK, Kids Co, Foyer, um, Foyer um, Centrepoint, Action for Children, Save the Children. All of these big charities are our partners, and their young people feed through into our organisation. And we gift that to them so that we can help them. We're also completely self-sustaining, just so you understand. And I'm going to explain to you how we've done it. So a friend of mine was the CEO of Right to Sight, and there were two doors at Right to Sight. And this was in Africa, and his last year in 2009, they gifted sight back to 50,000 people. And this was the story he told me. You'd come to a set of doors and to a surgery. One door would say, I can afford to pay, and one door says, I can't afford today. I can't afford to pay. And you get exactly the same service. So that is exactly the same concept that we use within Mo. If you can afford to contribute, contribute. If you can't, contribute in a different way. Don't worry about the money. We will. We'll figure it out. We'll find a way to do it. We give them access to great coaches. We give them access to great learning. Uh, and we've built a whole pathway, which I'm going to share with you in a minute. Here it is. So what we can see here is people come into Mo. They look at first program is, you know, actually, I want to qualify you as a coach. But it's not just that. We've also got our Dream Factory program, which helps people set up businesses. So in January, we had 12 young people, and we had 11 entrepreneurs came in for two days to share with them loads of knowledge and, and loads of top tips on how to set up their organizations. Really practical, tough love. You know, Mo is not a soft, fluffy pay place. This is, if you want to do it, you've got to work hard. You know, I've not got to where I've got to. My family have not got to where we've got to by, by having it easy. We've worked hard. In my experience, entrepreneurs, the people I work with, they work hard. So work hard. Learn to discipline yourself. But actually, what we try and do is get into the mindset of them and help them realize, actually, you can truly do this. And the wonderful thing is, if you believe in someone more than they believe in themselves, they will do it. It's incredible. So we've built this whole pathway. But the other thing is now, if you come onto one of our Mo Coach training programs, and we'd love to do one in Guernsey for you, and then you can take it on and, and take it further, is the young people then become the trainers. So they don't only learn the skills, they actually become trainers, which then helps them get jobs. Yeah? It helps them do other things that are really, really useful and powerful. And I wanted to share with you a couple of thoughts. You know, because this is TED, and I'm supposed to come with some new novel ideas, and I'm not sure that I do, because this, to me, seems really simple and simplistic. You know, for me, it's people, it's connections. But what I often see us doing is going down the wrong path. Yeah, over here, I see a lot of us acting impotent. Yeah, we blame politicians for the way the state of the economy. We blame bankers and corporates and organisations because they've done the wrong things and they've got the wrong ethics. You know, we blame society and the poor in society and that TV programme on in the UK where it's Benefit Street, and we blame them for being terrible human beings. And then, you know, we blame and ostracise individuals. It doesn't work, because what we're doing when we do that is we're disempowering ourselves. If you're upset about something, if something's really, really offending you, you know, passion, you know, anger is the tip of passion. If you're angry about something, do something about it. Take the first step. So what we try and encourage is the inside-out model. OK, so let's look at you. Let's look at what you individually can do. Start taking that difference, making that difference, doing those one things. Then what you can start to do, like we're doing, is you start to be, build a we, an us. It's beyond the individual. It's about collectively what we can achieve. And now guess what happens? I've got five corporate partners. I've got Citibank. Yeah, we hate bankers, don't we? Citibank are our biggest sponsor. They don't give us any money, they give us space so we can do the training. Allen and Overy, Talk Talk, um, Network Rail, um, Rio Tinto, all these big awful corporates. They're there to support us, they're given us space to help us. So actually, as you go up the, the right hand side, you can start to influence them. I've not bothered with politicians yet. <laughs> I've got three minutes, so I'm going to crack on. So, mindset shift. Here's the big shift that I think that we've got to make in terms of the, you know, the, the wider perspective. We're focused on return on investment in organisations. We're focused on money. And in, in my experience, I go and work with CEOs, I work with uh, senior leaders in my consultancy business. And what happens is, they've tracked up here because they wanted to earn money, and then they hit a brick wall, and it's called crisis of meaning. Because actually, that organisation doesn't do what they love. They're earning lots of money. I was talking to a banker the other day. He was bitching at me because he's got a million pounds bonus. 
I was like, are you serious? You've got a million pounds bonus, and you're sitting there having a go and telling me about this? It's crazy, right? But so they, we hit this crisis of meaning where suddenly the money doesn't matter. It's not, it's not making, it's not helping us. Over here, we've got people who do things because it feels right. It's values, it's social entrepreneurships, it's great charities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the problem is with that is it becomes dependent on goodwill. It becomes dependent on money. And you have to do things in order to fund it, and it becomes really difficult, and everyone starts battling for the small pools of money. I think where we've got to move to is what I call the return on contribution. And that is a model like we've just, I've just shared with you. Those who can afford to pay, pay. Those who can't, can't. My charity, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this. Today, I got my charity commission, my number came through. So, we're official charity today. So another rule broken, another rule broken. For two years we've been operating as a charity and I've only today got my charity number. I didn't seek permission, I seek forgiveness. Yeah? So shh, sorry. Shouldn't have told you that, damn it. <laughs> Here, right, so two, uh, 18 months ago I went out to Tanzania. Uh, I, I did what I call micro-gifting. Not micro-finance, micro-gifting. Uh, my friends, Hugh, Gary and I, we went out to Tanzania. I gifted them £4,000, we built a chicken farm and we bought them 300 chickens. Uh, 270 of those, those were supposed to be hens, uh, and unfortunately, uh, it turned out that 150 were, were actually cocks, males. Um, and so they had to sell them. But here's the good news. That chicken farm has actually grown. Uh, it's now got 400 chickens. They've got their own bank accounts, and they're completely sustainable, which is amazing. So that was a small random act. Here's a couple of quotes. I'm not going to share them, but I love this. It's all about planting a seed. Yeah, we plant a seed, and they take it forwards. Here, it's fundamentally impacted this person's life. Yeah, it's game-changing their life. It's making them realize they can do things they never thought they could do. Yeah, and all we've done is plant the seed to support them. Here's where we're going to go. This is where we've got to get to. We're too focused on being a human race. We're not focused enough on being humankind. We've got to start looking at the whole system. We've got to start looking at the planet as our home. We've got to start looking after it on a big picture perspective, but I'm not going to bore you with that right now. And the, I think the final things that I want to share with you, because this is all about community, is you've got to get a very clear why, you've got to get very clear what and how, but just start doing it. Yeah? Have a big dream and go for it. Don't let your fears, don't let your limitations stop you. And please, what I encourage you all, all to do is please make a difference in a moment, because it does make a fundamental difference. It helps people, and you, equally, get to feel really good about it as well. And I'm sorry I've rushed slightly there, but I'm on seven seconds. Um, I'm going to leave you with a quote that I love about my mum. She had dark humour. Here's a, one of her famous quotes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure.